everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, What's in a Name? Product, Titles, and Brands in Google Shopping, um, hosted by Commerce Hub and Hannapin Marketing. My name is Jamie Newton, and I am the Communications Manager for Hannapin, and I'll be your moderator today. And your presenter is going to be Elizabeth Marsden, um, who is the Director of Paid Search at Commerce Hub. She is also one of the 2016 Top 25 Most Influential PPC Experts. Um, if you want to follow her on Twitter, you can at EV Kendo. Um, hey, Elizabeth, how are you doing today? Hey, nice to, nice to be here, finally. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we're very excited to have you. Um, real quick before we jump into Elizabeth's presentation, um, we've got just a couple of housekeeping items to do. Um, so if you want to join the conversation today, um, you can join, you can uh, include the hashtag ThinkPPC in your Twitter tweets. Or um, we will be doing a live Q&A at the end of today's presentation. So if you'll use that webinar question box, um, which is located in your GoToWebinar control panel, go ahead and submit your questions throughout the presentation, and we will get to as many as we can during the live Q&A. All right, uh, a poll question for our audience. Um, Elizabeth, if you'll go to that next slide. How long have you been in PPC? Um, less than one year, one to three years, three to five years, or five plus years. So if you'll take a minute and uh, let us know how long you've been in PPC, that'd be awesome. Um, hey, Elizabeth, how long have you been in PPC? I would have to select D. I, I hit 10 years just this last June. Oh, wow. So we're, you're what we like to call a dinosaur? <laughs> no, we, we call no. that a classic. <laughs> oh, or, I love it. <laughs> or a early adopter. Early adopter, fantastic. All right. Um, so let's see what our results are. All right. One to three years looks like that's the leading category. Um, and then we have some less than one year is about 24%, three to five years is 17%, and five plus years are classic models, as, as Elizabeth says, is five plus years. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for being on the presentation today. Um, and we will go ahead and get started. Elizabeth, I will hand it off to you. Awesome. Thank you. So a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Jamie for the warm welcome, and you know, thanks for letting me be here. I was, you know, asked to do a webinar back in I want to say it was January, and I was about uh, eight to nine months pregnant at the time, <laughs> and so it didn't work out so much. <laughs> and then trying to get back on track is a heck of a thing. So when I'm finally back in the office, back back to full time, and uh, the kiddos at home. So first thing, just a little bit about where I'm from. So Commerce Hub, we actually, um, we are now a public, publicly traded company. You can buy Commerce Hub stock uh, as of last Monday, and that's our, our ticker symbol. But just really quick on what we are. So we are demand, supply, and delivery. So I work in the demand section in particular in that little box there with Google and, and Facebook. So we do the kind of, in a sense, product feed management, but also data quality and performance management. And then obviously we connect uh, suppliers and distributors. So we have a network of 9,000 uh, suppliers throughout the United States and we connect uh, major retailers to those uh, distributors so that they can expand their assortment online without actually having to hold that inventory in a warehouse. So that's just really quick. And here we go. So product titles. I think we all can agree that names are important. Um, there are at least no less, no less than three tumblers alone dedicated to Starbucks misspelling the name on the side of the cup. And this just happened to be one of my favorites is Angry Ingrid here. But they're also important for not only people, but products as well. This is obviously my daughter. Um, and you'd be surprised at how, um, how much research and, and didn't go into choosing her name. We didn't name her Apple or anything completely weird like that, but it was one of those things where we only found one girl's name that I liked, and that that was it. Like, the research was done. We Googled it. We Googled the initials, and then we decided that that was the, the minimal amount of damage on the playground could be made with that name combination, and that's what we went with. But for product titles in particular, Depending on the category, for Google, the feed that we send in, there are at least 20 required attributes for a single product, right? Just And then title only just being one of those. And we don't know necessarily how Google weights every single one of those those attributes for product. But we do know that it, it 
just just from being a paid search practitioner and being in the interface and seeing results and and optimizing from there, we know that product title has got to be one of the most important. And I know that they have Google has said this, uh, even though they may not uh, publicly put out a lot of things that I can link to. But like I said, without a com with a complete lack of citation, I think we can agree that it is one of the most important attributes, you know, in a product title because it's the name of the thing that you're selling. If if anything else, so without it, we're just yelling "Hey you!" or you know, who knows what's on the side of those Starbucks cups. So let's dig in a little bit more. In particular, what I wanted to talk about first today was brand and title. So one of the things that we know, for example, is brand in a title is going to be important, but it depends on that level of importance depends on a few things. So one is what is the strength of that brand? And when we say strength, I'm thinking about do you know it already? Or, you know, Nike uh, is obviously a strong brand. I mean, Under Armour, anything like that where you say it and you're like, yeah, I know exactly what that is. Not only do you know what that is, you know what the brand voice is and you know uh, the feeling that comes along with that brand. So those are what was, that would be like considered the top end of a strong brand. And then you've got those little guys where like, you know, if I steal from a Simpsons episode, they have Panaphonics and Sorny TVs. Maybe it sounds familiar, but maybe it's not necessarily the strongest brand. Um, and does it matter based on the type of product? Like if it's a TV, does the brand matter? Or if it's clothes, does the brand matter? And then do you lead with the brand name? Do you leave it out entirely? Or do you put it on the end? And so as with all things PPC, we tend to come with, of course, the it depends. So one thing that we know for sure, a basic structure recommendation for a product, product title where the brand is a known known entity, so something like like we're saying, like Nike or a Cole Haan or a Kenneth Cole or uh, maybe even some of the kind of the mid-tier brands, you do know you want it to be like a brand name, lead with it, product, what it is, and an attribute in all cases where you can get all that in. And one of the ways that you can determine strength of a brand, or several ways that you can determine strength of a brand, is using Google Trends. So this is just a, a screenshot from a, a brand name that I tossed in there to see what it would look like. And of course, it wouldn't let me do the little forecast, um, like sometimes it lets you do. So you can kind of see strength over time. I would also say you could use a little common sense. You know, if you've never even heard of it and you Google it and then you go into the SERP result there and they don't even own their uh, organic listing for their name, like it's not the first one, it's probably not a really strong brand. And then additionally, use social media signals. So this is just pulled from a similar web for a brand name, just kind of give you an idea of what the breakdown is on a per channel basis, where their strength is. But you can also just kind of go into Twitter and go into Facebook and look and see what the conversation is and see if anyone is... It, if, if they're active on social, do they have like customer service running through there? There's a lot of folks that, that tag them. Um, obviously, there's a little bit of a reputation management thing there as well. So when you Google it, does a bunch of stuff come up that says so and so is a scam, um, or don't read these, or uh, don't buy from these guys? And you can obviously look at, uh, and I didn't put it in here, but like seller ratings or product ratings, and take a look and see what the the consensus is uh, publicly. And then of course, there's always the internet retailer top weight 100 and 500. Chances are, if in their top 100, it's probably probably pretty strong brand, or uh, a parent brand, a parent company that has several strong brands underneath it. So, so top 100 and 500. And then, but when you look at brand, it's like who cares, right? So depending on, like I was saying, the product, it may or may not matter. So in this case, you have a bunch of shoes, if I can call them that. Um, that probably brand doesn't matter so much. There, this is euros, so 100 euros. So it's like what, 10 bucks, something like that. So, uh, or 100, 100 bucks. So maybe these don't matter for brand that much. Maybe you're just focusing on color. Maybe you're just focusing on like a style or a particular attribute. So how would you go about even beginning to test this? So what are the, we've done a few tests at Commerce Hub around product titles in particular. Obviously being a uh, top attribute that we want to um, to work with. One of the things that we're able to do is because of we have the tool for feed management, we're able to write content rules. And within these content rules, we can say, okay, when you send the product to Google, change the product title to this. When you send the product to Amazon, do this. When you send it to comparison shopping engines, do this. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed time and time again across the book of clients uh, over the years is uh, when it comes to apparel, when the price needs to be low. So kids' clothing in particular and adaptive clothing. So 
adaptive clothing, just for those of you that don't know, I had to, to look this up the first time I heard it. Um, adaptive clothing is, well, it's old people clothing. Let's, it, it, to, 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 to make it simple. So when uh, folks have arthritis and things like in their fingers and they can't quite work the buttons and zippers anymore, there's a whole line of clothing where it has buttons on the front, so it might be a button-up shirt, but underneath it, it's Velcro. So it looks like it's a button-up shirt, but they can pull it apart with Velcro or uh, snaps. And so there's an entire line of clothes that uh, work that way. And a lot of uh, uh, what we've decided, what we found is there is when a senior person enters a um, nursing home, a lot of times they will run out of clothes or they need new clothes. And so what will happen is the nurses hand the adult parent a catalog and say, here, mom needs more nightgowns. And they will literally, instead of just picking, they don't, they just pick by style. They say, like, okay, this one, five of this one. And they just buy it in, in bulk. And the brand doesn't matter whatsoever. That is where it's a price comparison thing. Same with like some of the kids' clothes. So there's a few kids' brands that are pretty uh, strong. But for the most part, if you have to buy something in bulk, like say uniforms, and you just want the cheapest thing because they're going to outgrow it in three weeks, doesn't matter. However, when it comes to luxury goods where the price is typically high, you always want to lead with the brand because those brands have put together a lot of marketing material and hours to build up the strength of that brand, and it's a known, it's a known entity. Home decor was one where we found brand goes either way. So aesthetic and features may be more important, you know, like a striped rug versus a, uh, you know, generic, you know, company X striped rug. Um, but in some cases it may matter. So like Martha Stewart's uh, collection, home striped rug. Um, I think Macy's right now, they're pulling all of the uh, the Trump brand um, uh, items these days. So you might take a, take a watch, watch that one. Uh, and then pet supplies. This is also one where we've seen where brand may not matter so much. So for example, if you are buying a crate to put your dog in or your puppy in, you're probably not as concerned with what brand it is as much as you are, will it contain the puppy? Uh, and then in particular, as the product that I, I well, that always makes me laugh when I see it is cat bow ties. Um, that is that is a real thing. That is a product that people look for quite a bit. Um, and they are not so concerned with brand as they are about matching the cat. So a little bit more going deeper. What about gender when it comes to product titles? Um, you know, and these were the two pictures that I could find that were uh, copyright free that are very specific to perhaps a particular gender. So when does it? When do you leave out men's and when do you leave out women's when it comes to putting together a product title? So beard trimmers. I think we can probably get the consensus that that is mostly a men's product. So maybe you don't even need the word men. So men's brand X beard trimmer. Instead, you could be leading with the brand or you could be adding an attribute on the end, like say cordless, uh, rechargeable, anything like that. You only have so many characters when it comes to something that is very clearly male or female. It's completely worth the test to take it out. And I'm actually going to dig into that a little bit more too. Um, and then for example, like women's maternity sundress. Pretty sure only women buy maternity sun wear maternity sundresses. Um, I mean, a guy could, but it's really his choice. But I think on average, it's probably a women's product. So instead of putting in maternity women's maternity sundress, you could be putting in an attribute like jersey knit or striped or even a brand if it mattered. And for women's, what we found more than off more more often than not is where it really matters: women's apparel. So the ability to add attributes like material, color, and style over using the word women's. So to get in, to kind of back that up a little bit more, women's apparel has a lot more descriptors and a lot more types of clothing that apply largely to women. So, um, you know, there's between just not even just like dresses and skirts kind of thing, but beyond uh, like blouses, like men don't really search for blouses. I guess if they were into like pirate stuff, they might put that in. But for the most part, there's a lot more types of clothing and there's a lot more diversity in uh, what you might want to put in for attributes. However, when it's not obvious though, you do want to put in gender. So something like jeans, um, button up shirt, a uh, particular shoe perhaps, um, other than say pumps. Um, and then here's kind of what we saw at Commerce Hub over the, the past year. So one of the things that we did was we, uh, across a book of apparel clients, is ran the search query reports to find what were, we ran search query reports and we found most of the time 
gender wasn't even a part of the query. So people aren't even searching for, you know, women's knit sundress. They're just putting in knit sundress. They, they, it's not even part of it, so that kind of gave us the first indicator that maybe we don't even need it. So when we removed women's from an experimental group of products in multiple of our clients, both retailer and brand. So these are resellers where there would have been a brand name associated. They're, they're selling multiple brands and then also uh, a brand, several brand clients that were selling their own stuff. So we looked at it and said, okay, for women's apparel, for this, this type of apparel, what happens if we remove women's? Um, with from this subset and what we saw was that each time performance improved for each one of these clients both in click-through rate and in sales sometimes those sales were for those individual products that were part of the the test but the overall lift to all of the sales was the biggest driver of the change so that kind of goes back to what we keep talking about with, uh, you know, we all have various statistics depending on the, the size of the book of clients you have. Do people actually buy the thing that they clicked on? Well, I believe there's a couple of stats anywhere out there from, you know, only 10 to 30 percent of the time do they actually buy the thing that they clicked on. Uh, and in this case, we felt that that was kind of related uh, as far as what, um, what, why we saw overall sales jump, but not necessarily those individual products that people came in on. So they came in, they were looking for jersey knit sundresses, they came in and they're like, hey, I, I, I clicked on the striped one, but now that I've seen this polka dot one, that's the one I'm going to buy. Or maybe they looked at it and went, you know what, I don't want any of these, but damn, these shoes look good. So uh, from a statistical significance standpoint, we didn't find, we didn't feel that these individual products that had uh, it was too sporadic between which ones had sales and which ones didn't within that test. But if you looked at the overall portfolio, it made a lot of sense. So this change was then rolled out to all the remaining products in those categories. So we looked at it and said, all right, we don't really need the women, word women's. Let's go ahead and populate with uh, additional attributes. And the way that we just decided what those attributes were was simply by removing women's, letting that um, what normally would have been truncated description for the product title. Uh, just moved up. So we didn't actually go in and say for every single product, um, you know, put this attribute instead. We just let it so that it wasn't so truncated anymore. And then additionally, when it comes to uh, product titles, so besides gender, colors. So uh, colors is a funny thing because colors you could put, you can put in the product title or not. So for example, if you sold nail polish, I can't even I can't even imagine what your product feed looks like. Um, it must be um, you know absolute hell actually to make it uh, to make this work because you put in you know you got your brand China glaze and then it says are you jelly? So you will get some searches probably on are you jelly, but should you also be putting the color perhaps in the product title? And the answer is yes, especially when you do. Uh, really unique titles like this because it's so odd. You, can, you won't be able to tell that Sachet My Way is like gold glitter, for example. Um, and so kind of like a few points on that. So no, you want to make it normal. So you want to add normal or standard color names. Uh, when you have a patterned or multicolored, use the main color in the pattern or submit like multicolor or various. I always go with like, so if you did the Are You Jelly, it would be, you know, um, China Glaze Are You Jelly Purple Nail Polish. Uh, you can submit a dominant color and accents in the feed, but your best bet is not to be weird about it. Just make sure that it's kind of standardized. And they cut you off after 40 characters anyway uh, when it comes to comes to this, so you don't want to get too creative as it is. Um, and actually, the, you know, there's entire tumblers dedicated to nail polish colors. Um, now I know this, and my life is complete. Uh, another time when, in, when it comes to product titles, when... It, brand may not matter is uh, occasion type items. So product title structure can live without the. Uh, pro this is a this is a product title structure that can live without the brand, where it's an occasion, and then you have the product type, and then you have the attributes, right? So when you go to buy your sexy swashbuckler costume, um, there's probably not a particular brand that you have in mind, uh, especially when it, you know, those Halloween costumes in general. Uh, you're looking for a very specific. Uh, style or I don't know maybe that maybe maybe you want that Oscar Mayer hot dog costume but uh, more likely than not you're going to be able to just find a hot dog costume and live with it uh, and this goes for like holiday any other holidays as well so like Christmas items in particular we can put it in decorations uh, maybe you have a whole bunch of a line of like novelty toys and whatnot so like uh, party supplies 
usually brands don't matter so much when it comes to that. You either have the gold paper plates or you don't. So you don't even want to uh, bother taking up that real estate uh, and just go ahead and either put in an occasion and or the product type first. Um, but I do find more often than not that the occasion is very is in particular uh, helpful. So we had, uh, I worked with a client that did some um, like scented candles and they had some very unique names for the different scents. And uh, adding the, the holiday in particular because they had a very specific line that came out at two times a year they had a, kind of like a spring and summer line and then a holiday Christmas line or Halloween and Christmas towards the end so it was really important to put in things like Halloween when it came to some of the scents because nobody would be able to guess that that scent was related to Halloween otherwise so one of the other things I wanted to talk about a little bit is what else might affect product title performance so we've got all these names you, you put it together it's one of your top attributes but what else out there kind of uh, either attributes to it in, in, in terms of like a click-through rate, in terms of maybe like a quality score outlook, or just uh, kind of your your portfolio in general. And the first one is Manufacturer Center. So if you're not familiar with Manufacturer Center, you probably want to take a, a closer look at it or start following it. So brands can now go into Manufacturer Center and in a sense claim their catalog. So they can submit and their catalog and say, hey Google, this is my stuff. I make this stuff and I'm going to give you more information and this is going to be my centralized area in which uh, this information is for these products. So uh, this, is a, this is, I've got a link here to the Bosch uh, case study that Google did with them for Manufacturer Center. They saw 4% lift in conversion rate when they implemented uh, Manufacturer Center. Uh, and, and what they did was they gave in more information so it could be like a weight it could be um, uh, other attributes like handheld it could be um, uh, size but what it does is everybody submits product feeds and they may or may not all submit the same information and some of it may be uh, more alike than others when it comes to retailers selling brand um, items so one of the things that Manufacturer Center does is kind of help start to uh, even that out. The important thing to note, though, more than anything else, is it will not override a PLA product title. So while the rest of the attributes uh, may get uh, adjusted, the PLA product title will stay the same. So if you spend all that time making, you know, very, very uh, classy product titles, that will not get overridden. Um, and then for where manufacturer uh, information may show up in product cards in a Google SERP, Google Shopping, they were not super clear on where in Google Shopping, they just kind of like here, uh, like this screenshot, and this is a product card, Google Now and Google Express, which is the new one where they're going to bring the stuff to your house. Uh, the other thing that uh, affects product titles are G10, so uh, May 16th they rolled out that you had to have a G10 assigned or some kind of uh, 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 product identifier assigned to every single product, uh, in particular for certain brands and for certain verticals. They got really strict about that and part of that has to do again with like the manufacturer center piece. So they wanted the single source of truth for product attributes, like what truly is a blue Fitbit of this size, like what, what, are, the, what are the attributes that belong to this particular product. The way I kind of look at it is it puts us on the road for a potential for almost like a quality score type uh, future. Uh, we already know that individual products are, have some sort of history when they get uploaded into AdWords and they get served and they have PLA uh, action on them. Obviously, it's not a visible uh, score of some kind, but we do know, for example, that if you have a particular product that's just, it keeps getting uh, uh, kicked out or it's not doing well or like it's just screwed up in general, one of the things you can do is just delete it from the feed and get it a new, get in a new product ID. It's not going to work anymore because of the the G tins. Now we have the single uh, source of source of truth. I kind of look at it as an exact match um, for products, the same way that we have an exact match for keywords. So we are telling Google and we're giving the, the inform giving them the information that this is this particular item, and then now they're able to track history and um, behavior around that item as it appears within the search index and how folks interact with it and how it converts or doesn't convert. So in a sense, it's one catalog to rule them all. And the other thing I like to look at 
uh, is brands and ge is brands and geography, and this is from Google Insights. This is their tool that they rolled out. I want to say last summer, and it was cool. And we looked at it. And we started putting things in. It was fun to play with. Um, and at the time, we couldn't quite decide what it is that we were going to do with it. And now I have a better idea of what we're going to do with it. So as you go in to put in brands and you start to look at brand strength, it may matter to you uh, which areas of the country that brand strength is in. So in particular, when you start looking at local inventory ads and you're submitting a different feed there, if there is a difference in terms of brand strength, maybe you want to uh, include it more often than not, or maybe you want to exclude it depending on uh, weaknesses or strengths uh, in your overall portfolio. Okay, so last but not least, I did write everything down in kind of a takeaway tips uh, slide here. So one, and I didn't have a dedicated slide to this earlier in the presentation because I think that we all know this one. This is part of the common sense. Avoid duplicate titles. You want to be unique. So having the exact same title for 17 things just, just doesn't work very well. Um, as we said, use brand names. Um, and it obviously depends where you want to put that brand name based on strength, based on priority, and based on uh, the category. Use colors, materials for apparel whenever you can. Use sizes and weights for items like furniture, tools, and consumables. So consumables in particular, and I didn't have like specific examples for this particular deck, but I do know that um, consumables there can be more difficult to sell. Um, you know, it's the kind of, especially if it's the kind of thing you can get in a grocery store, or maybe you can get, you know, when you put together your Amazon order of like 30 things or Amazon Fresh. Um, so making sure that anything that is unique in that way in terms of how big it is, um, so it's very clear to the shopper what it is that they're getting right out of the gate with that product title. You know, seasons and holidays, like we talked about, Christmas, Halloween uh, in particular, love putting those in. And then when you can, if you have, like if it's a book, you would definitely want to put the author in there up front. Uh, celebrity, those Kardashians, they, uh, you know, they like to bring it, so why, why not? Um, and then designer names when it applies, and that's obviously with luxury goods in particular. So that is my takeaways, and I believe, Jamie, we have something else here. Yeah, well, first, um, thank you, Elizabeth. That was a, a great presentation, and I, I think our audience really appreciates you putting together that takeaway tip slide because um, it's awesome just to look at it and be able to apply to our accounts. So thank you for doing that. Um, real quick before we get to the live Q&A session or <laughs> the live Q&A portion, um, if you do have questions, go ahead and submit those. We're going to do an offer real quick. So, Elizabeth, if you'll go to that next slide. Um, if you would like an account analysis by the experts at here at Hannapin, um, so what an account analysis is, it's for accounts that spend um, 20 plus K per month in ad spend. Um, one of our, our PPC experts will look into your account, they'll identify what's good, what's not so good, opportunities for expansion and growth. Um, so it's really for anybody that needs a fresh pair of eyes on your account. Um, which is always a, a great thing. So this is for um, advertisers um, that are spending 20k plus per month. Um, so if you would like that, please go ahead and fill out um, that first column that yes, you'd like to receive it. Or if you're not interested, that's totally fine too. Just go ahead and put no thanks. All right, so we will keep that open for just a little bit. And we're going to go ahead on to our Q&A portion. Um, so let me look at these questions. So. And actually, there was one thing that, that I forgot to mention as I was uh, going going through the deck, and um, and that is one thing to take into consideration is scalability in product titles. So if you have you know 300,000 products, uh, you may have to make some uh, kind of may have to make some decisions that. Uh, don't get to be as granular as you'd like to be. Now, if you can do, if you only have like a thousand products and you're able to do like a Excel spreadsheet or a Google spreadsheet in order to do this, you can get really creative with your product titles. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so we have this first question, um, and I'm not sure if you've used this or not, but somebody is asking about Google POG beta. Um, they're in the beta right mm -hmm. now. I was wondering if you would be able to share any kind of benchmarks. A couple of things. Um, POG purchases on Google. It's the buy button. It's uh, they don't want you to call it that. They want you to call it purchase on Google. But uh, that you might commonly know it as that. And it is considered still an experiment at this time or a pilot. So. 
Um, the stats around it are far and few between. Um, I am not able to share any direct um, uh, information at this time. I can tell you that um, there are a few things that came out. So UGG in particular, there is a public facing um, uh, piece of collateral from Google. I think it was like Shop Talk they announced. UGG saw it was, I believe, a 25% um, lift in conversions uh, on mobile PLAs. Uh, and a 50% decrease in like cost per action for that. So one of the things, you may not have the same results, but one of the things that it does in particular that's really important is it's removing, it's removing friction. And so if you have mobile PLAs or you have mobile traffic like we all do, it's growing, right? And it's not getting replaced by say like desktop or another device. It's just, it may be the same amount of traffic that you have, it's just kind of the devices are uh, one's growing more than the other and it may stay flat. So something like purchases on Google is really cool because as, the as we go forward in the future, as it reduces uh, friction to conversion on mobile devices, um, that's great because then we're recouping, if not um, keeping what might have been lost traffic for sales. So okay. I wish I had more benchmarking information, but I am not allowed to share at this time. Gotcha. Okay. No worries on that. Thank you. Okay, here's another question. For manufacturer center, if I'm a reseller, how can I control this data, especially if many of the brands are smaller brands? So you can't. So manufacturer center is for the brands. So as a reseller or a retailer, you are at their mercy. Um, you could uh, tell a smaller brand or recommend to a smaller brand that they get on manufacturer center, and it might help... Um, give them the, the ammo or the, the, you know, get them to invest in the resources in which to do that so that they kind of standardize their product data. But uh, there's not a lot you can make them do. Gotcha. Okay, um, we're just going to do one or two more because we are running very low on time. So um, this is from Chris. If we utilize a color field column on our shopping feed, do you still recommend that we implement color in the title as well? Depends, I would say. So if it's like a really standardized color or if it doesn't matter, um, I mean the feed attribute, the feed will pick it up, right? So when you look at the, the PLA uh, results, it'll be in there. It, I would say it's more like if it's unique um, or um, it's a popular color. So what is it that there was a new blue that they found, I don't know, recently. If you, for whatever reason, happen to have something in that new color, maybe you want to throw that in there for attention more than anything else. Um, but really, it's only if uh, it really matters in terms of, like, say, apparel, and you wanted to pull it up for an additional attribute, I would still go with material over color because you have the picture. Um, but if it's like... Uh, you know, something like the extreme example was the nail polish, where it's like the name is not even be not even like close to what it is. Like, are you jelly? No one's gonna know what that is. Like, I would recommend putting it in. Great. Okay, uh, just one more question, and I think I can answer this one. Um, we've had a, a couple of people asking if the slides and recording will be available. Yes, it will. Um, if we will send the recording and slides to your the email that you registered for the webinar with um, tomorrow afternoon. So we are in Eastern Standard Time, so it'll be tomorrow afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. You will get today's webinar recording, and you will also get the slides. So that is all the time that we have for today. Um, we're going to end this the poll, and uh, we'll go to that last slide. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you have any feedback or if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to email us at marketing at Um If you have any more questions for Elizabeth, you can ask her on Twitter at EVKendo. And thank you, Elizabeth, again, for joining us today, for um, doing an awesome presentation. Um, so many valuable insights. We were really excited to finally get you on the webinar. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, hey, the kid's sleeping through the night now. I mean, I think we should thank her the most. That is basically <laughs> what has made it possible. Yes. <laughs> Good job, kiddo. All right, thanks, guys. Have a, a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.